Today's word comes from Mark chapter 3, verses 7 to 12. Mark chapter 3, verses 7 to 12. Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the sea, and a great crowded crowd followed from Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem and Idumea and from beyond the Jordan and from around Tyre and Sidon. When the great crowd heard all that he was doing, they came to him and, they to and he told his disciple to have a boat ready for him because of the crowd, lest they crush him. For he had healed many, so that all who had diseases pressed around him to touch him. And whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. And he strictly ordered them not to make him known. This is the word of God. This is um, you know, the kind of passage that you're reading along, and it seems to be the kind of typical thing you would hear about from Jesus. He is popular because he can heal people of their diseases and lots of people, you know, they want, they want that. They come to him. But then at the last portion of this text, you get this strange twist. You have demons. That's, that's I know that's, that part's especially weird for us moderns. Demons actually talk. And they identify him. They say, you're the son of God. And you know, they actually could say, and in a sense, they're proof. Here's this uh, portion of what happened, and there's all these skeptical people. You know, I mean, if, it, if Jesus was uh, walking around in our city today, there'd be a lot more skeptical people, probably, right? Um, but here is something that happens that if you're a skeptic of who is this guy, Jesus, who the heck is he? Is he worth following? Is he worth believing in? Here's this supernatural thing that happens. I mean, first you could just see somebody, you see the miracle. Leper, he's healed. Blind guy, can see. Crazy stuff, completely like astounding stuff. So that would be amazing. But you'd still be going, well, we've seen some other wonder workers, or at least I've heard of some before. Who is this guy? Who's this guy? And then you get to this strange um, this portion, a supernatural you know, perspective is given. <laughs> uh, a demon, demons say, demons fall down. This is the way the, the passage, the demons fall down before this person and say, you're the son of God. But then this is really strange. Jesus then basically tells them to shut up. <laughs> it's really weird. Why would he do that? Why would he do that? Um, you know, this is an extraordinary uh, question that's been raised uh, throughout history. Um, Bible scholars have read this thing, and they even have a, a name for it. They have a name for this, this question, and they've debated like literally 2,000 years. People read this question and go like, what is with that? <laughs> what, why? Why? Why would he, why would he do that? Right? And the name they have is, um, for this, this thing that's happening is they call it the Messianic Secret. They actually have a name for it. Right? And so if you open up Bible commentaries, brilliant guys with PhDs, they name, this, they name this phenomenon, they call it the Messianic Secret. Why would the Messiah keep his identity as the Messiah, the Son of God, become a human being to be a king and bring about a kingdom that's going to change everything. Why would he want to keep that quiet? <laughs> and that's what we're going to wrestle with today. Right? That's, the, that's the question we're going to wrestle with today. Part one, the surprising most human man. The surprising most human man. Part two, I want to ask you a question because it's relevant to this, to this passage. And that question I want you to wrestle with is this. What do you want from God? That's part two. What do you, I'm asking you, right? What do you personally want from God? I think that's raised in this question. And part three, the deeper healing of the cross. There's something about the cross 
It's not explicitly mentioned here, but it's there. <laughs> the deeper healing of the cross. Um, so let, let's get into this passage. The most surprising human man. Um, why do I put it this way? Well, let, let's just first look at the passage. Um, Jesus withdraws with his disciples. I mean, he's, he's tired. He's busy. He's in demand. Um, you would probably be in demand if you could heal... <laughs> If you could heal diseases that nobody else can heal, um, you know, just 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 try to think about. It. I mean, from our, you know, we don't tend to deal with real leprosy or something like that. But, you know, let's just say, uh, you know, I, one of um, there's a famous uh, um, pitching coach. I recently read that he died of multiple myeloma. You know, that's that's a cancer we have no answer for. Rare cancer, and um, you get multiple myeloma. That's that's it. You know, you're gonna die. And um, imagine if there was a healer, there was a healer in our city, and word spread, he can heal multiple myeloma. He can handle that. Like, no way, no way, that's baloney, that is not real, all right? And then, you're like, it's totally real. I'll introduce you to my cousin. He was dying. And I'll show you the scans. I'll show you all proof that he completely had this disease. And you can meet him. And you can decide for yourself. So it's not like, you know, we tend to think we're, we're moderns. We have science. We're so sophisticated. We don't believe in miracles. I mean, come on. 2,000 years ago, you think these people they live everyday normal life. It's, okay, look, today, if there's a miracle, it's a highly unusual thing, right? It's a crazy thing. And if you're going to believe that there is such a thing as a miraculous healing, you would want some serious proof. So do you think, oh, these people 2,000 years ago, oh, they're all just gullible because we're moderns and we don't believe that. No, that's, that's, that's so arrogant. That is so arrogant. They're just people. We're people. And they have hurts, and they have problems. And they know everywhere in their life there's no answer to this disease. <laughs> They've gone to every single doctor just like we would go to every single doctor. I don't know if they had scientific journals, but they would go through every, every possible issue to solve this problem. So then some strange person comes along, and then just rumors, news, crazy, you know, like, if they had social media, it would spread really fast. Jesus. <laughs> That's what would happen. Jesus. Oh, my goodness. It's Jesus. And apparently, they didn't need social media for Jesus to blow up. So just try to think about this from our perspective. If somebody can heal something like multiple myeloma, um, today the news would spread so fast, everybody in the whole dang country who's got that disease would show up to the city. That's what's happening. That's what's happening. So it's such a huge, Jesus is a thing. I mean, Jesus is more than, he's, he's boom, he's an event. And um, everybody's showing up to this. Word is spreading up. And it's so, it's such a huge thing that Jesus has to say, Put, um, it, I'm, I'm tired, he's trying to get away. And he has to tell his disciples, get a boat, because otherwise these people are going to crush me. So that's like rock star and then some, right? <laughs> right? So um, I'm trying to I'm present it to you this way. So first, you wouldn't have this little, you know, it's a nice, you know, when, when I was a kid in, in, in church, we had a picture of Jesus on the boat. <laughs> and he was like, nice, and he's on the boat. <laughs> and there's all these people on the shore. Do you guys, you, ever, you guys grew up in the church, do you remember that? That pictogram, Jesus on the boat? It was, it, it was, it's much more graphic and serious than that. There's all these people on the shore, and they are like crammed up. <laughs> it's a crazy crowd, and there's somebody there, and then they got their lame son there. <laughs> there's somebody there, and they're all like not trying to touch this person because this person has leprosy. <laughs> but it's their cousin. That's who, it's all these people are there. And it's, it's a crazy crowd. And, they're, and they probably smell from their weird diseases. And it's, it's, a, it's not an easy scene. 
Now, listen to some of the other things that it says here. Uh, a great crowd followed. They're coming from Galilee, Judea. Galilee is in the north. Judea is in the south. Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the biggest city, the most important city. Okay, um, So the, the sophisticated people from the city are coming. The hick people from Galilee are coming. So it's not like the northerners are coming. So today it would be like, if you found this out, people from the south would come. People from the east coast would come. Wyoming, you know, Washington, Nevada, they're all coming. They'd all, if Jesus was in San Jose, they'd all show up. Because this is, this is the only place you have that answer. Okay? And so it gets even further. Idumea, I'm not even sure where that is, okay? Um, Jordan, Tyre. We're getting away from Israel here. You're starting to get into um, Gentile territory. People who don't believe in what the Jews believe are starting to get word, and they're like, I don't care about the Jewish. Who cares? <laughs> who cares if he's Jewish? Most people who are generally racist against the Jews are probably going like, who cares? If that's real, let's go check it out. <laughs> so an unbelievable movement is happening here. <laughs> Now, at the beginning of the Gospel of Mark, Jesus proclaims a kingdom. And that kingdom means he's supposed to be a king. It's a, it's a strange thing. And this movement is arising. So if you want something big to happen, a huge change to happen, this is it. It's happening. You know, you want some kind of important change to happen in your society. If people start literally coming from all around, they're crossing cultures and and an incredible popularity is happening. So this is Jesus' time. And if it's you or me, he's a king. He's proclaiming a kingdom. I'm the Messiah. <laughs> As a Messiah, I'm the king. And people have to follow me. And we're going to change things, right? This is the moment. He could stand up on that boat and say, I'm him. <laughs> I'm it. Follow me. Follow me, and then he'd have an army. He'd have, he'd, he'd have like the whole countryside. And it's so sometimes we wonder, like, why are these uh, Pharisees? Like, we talked about how there's people are starting to go into, um, they're starting to use political conspiracies last week. Why would these people be threatened? Because if you see this, I mean, this is not a theory. You show up and you're, oh my gosh, what is going on here? The whole world is falling after this guy. That's what you would see. It's like if, if two or three stadiums of people showed up to, to, to want to meet this person, you would go, this is crazy. You would feel threatened if you're the power, you're the power stake, folks. And that's what's happening. And yet, then, Jesus does something very, very strange. When the demons go, you're the son of God, he goes, no, be quiet, be quiet. Now, what I want to offer you is um, a couple of explanations, right? Now, um, I'm not some genius. I, I read about these from other people, and I, I think they're right, right. One of the things I think that's happening in this passage is, um, is a recurrence of Genesis chapter 3. What do I mean by that? So in Genesis chapter 3, for those of you, you know, maybe you're not quite sure what's, what, what's so important in Genesis chapter. Genesis chapter 1 and 2 is the, is the creation. God makes all things good. Then in Genesis chapter 3 is the temptation from the devil in the Garden of Eden. You guys all know the story. What you may not understand about that story is God's forbidding, don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So there's a human being, and he's like the head human being. There's only two, right? And Adam has a choice. Everything is given to him. Gorgeous wife, we're naked, we have all the food in the world. God walks with us. He's like our best friend and our father and everything. And all of creation, we have dominion over it. The animals obey we, we have food. We live in paradise. That's what the choice is. Ah, but there's a test. And this test is this. Don't eat from that tree. Don't touch that fruit. And what is that test about? And so if you follow the story very, very carefully, and it's been studied, of course, to death, but if you follow, 
I think one of the key components of the story, some people go, it seems like a really stupid thing. Don't eat this fruit or versus that fruit. I don't think there was anything special about, I, don't, I mean, first of all, I'm not sure if it was an apple. It could have been a peach, by the way. Forbidden peach. <laughs> Might have been a forbidden pineapple. Who knows what fruit it actually was, all right? The important thing is not exactly which fruit it was. The, it was forbidden by God. <laughs> and now there's a test. There's a question. Who are you in relationship to God? That's the question. That, there's a line. There's a line here. Who are you in relationship to God? And if you trust God is good, if you trust He is for you, I mean, all the evidence is he's completely good and it's gorgeous and he's completely... He, he, you, you don't have to guess whether he's for you. He, you can go hang out with him. God, can we have coffee tomorrow? <laughs> That's, Adam had that. Let's have coffee tomorrow. And you hang out with God, having coffee, and you find out he's really good. He's always good. Everything he made is gorgeous and good. There's no sin. There's no sin. There's no jealousy. There's no you know, little lies and all the other stuff that we're dealing with all the time. And that line basically says, will you trust him? <laughs> but the, 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 the devil, the way he put it was this. <laughs> if you go eat that, then you will know what God knows. <laughs> you know what the temptation is? The fundamental temptation is to grasp after the power of God himself. There's a line. There's a power. It's on that side. If you go and touch that fruit and eat it, you're saying, I want, I'm not sure I just want to let God be my God and be good to me. I want to find out what it's like to have his, his stuff, his power. And here, why is, that, why is this that Genesis chapter 3 in this passage? Because what we have here is, it's, it's strange. We find out about it from the demons of all people. Right? Well, I don't even know if they're people. Of all beings. Okay? And the demons say, you're the son of God. And I think that's very, very important. That we know that this person, he's a human being, but he is God, the son of God. Now, let me just stop for a moment here. Um, any of you have children? Some of you have children, some of you don't have children. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a dad. I've got three kids. Okay? Um, this is what it's like when you have a son or a daughter. Right? Sometimes there are dangerous things. And you know what you have to do? You have to draw a line. <laughs> son, all these toys, you can play with them. <laughs> right? So just to give you an example, uh, I'll give you one that especially was in my mind. Um, we lived in a poor neighborhood when my kids were really little. <laughs> and then um, there were roaches in our house, in our, in our apartment. It was really gross. My, my wife, you can just imagine, my wife, ah, okay? <laughs> just imagine, right? <laughs> oh, so disgusting! All right, it, 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 even I was like, I think bugs are gross, and I was like, oh my gosh. If you have roaches in your house, that's just like, that's like, only like about a hundred times worse than, than ants, <laughs> okay? Because ro roaches only come to your house if there's something like really gross and rotting that they want to eat in your house. I was like, oh gosh, there's like our neighbors or something so disgusting, okay? So I went to the store and I found the how do you get rid of roaches? You, you, I got the, this, this uh, roach poison. And what you do is you, you, it's like this brown gook and you don't touch it. If you touch it, then you accidentally like touch your skin. It's, like, ah, it's bad. It's so bad. <laughs> what you want them to do is eat it. <laughs> and then they go back to their little roach thing, and then, then they die. And then they all eat that carcass of the, the dead bug, and then they all die. Yes, victory. Okay? <laughs> and then your wife is stopped, is, 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 becomes happy. That's, that's my goal. Okay? <laughs> but what, I read the, the, the directions and found out, how poisonous it was, and I'm like, I have, I have a four-year-old kid. <laughs> I have a four-year-old and like a three-year-old and a baby. I can't put this stuff out in my house. If I put this stuff in my house, you know, you, you ever have a four-year-old boy? 
<laughs> you have a four-year-old boy? You can't have like poisonous stuff around the house. <laughs> you could tell them not to touch it. But if you tell them to touch it, what do you think they want to do? Touch it. <laughs> right? So then, so, so here's what I did. I put this horrific roach poison behind the, the I, I put it way back there behind the, the, the refrigerator. Um, my son was a very curious kid. So as soon as his dad's doing something he's never seen his dad do, he's like, well, what is going on? Got to see this. <laughs> so I'm like putting this little brown gick way back there and far enough away that I think he can't reach it. But you, 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 you can't, come on. You think your son can't reach it, but that's not a good assumption. <clears throat> that's not a good assumption. Then you turn, so then I said, all right. Then I turned to Hudson and I said this. If you go back there and touch, even put your foot out there, you will get the biggest meme ever. <laughs> I, I mean, I, mean I, I just got I put on the, the biggest scary face I possibly could. And I said, you hear me? And I put like, like Laura there too. I was like, don't go back there. Don't go back there. Do not go back there. You understand? They got like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, like, sure. Okay. Now, why am I telling you this? It seems, it seems like a completely silly story. It's relevant. You know why it's relevant? Because it's a question. Will he trust his dad? Will he trust his dad? The real question, he has, he has there's like two questions. Okay, there's like, hey, what's back there? <laughs> what's back there? My dad did something. It's interesting. Whatever he's doing is interesting. Let's go in there and find out. <laughs> That's one way to think about it. Another way, wait a second, but it's my dad. And my dad said, don't be touching that. And, and, um, and the boy has to think about this question. Do I get to do whatever the heck I want? <laughs> I think it's good to go find out whatever the heck I was back there because, hey, I'm me and I'm the boss of my life. Of course, he doesn't actually say that. He just kind of just feels it. <laughs> any of you ever parented any of your kids? They don't actually say that in their mind, but it's just there all the time. I could just do whatever I want. I'm just going to try it. <laughs> right? They don't know it's deadly poison. Stuff, put that put thing there. All right, now they're blind. <laughs> Touch the little brown gook, threw them in my eye, blind. Touch your little sister, she's blind. Oh, great. <laughs> this is what I'm thinking when I'm reading this thing. I'm like, oh, gosh. Oh, gosh. That's, what, that's literally what I'm thinking. Blind son, blind daughter. That's, that's literally what I'm thinking when I'm reading this, the roach poison the, the thing. Okay? And so when I say this to my son, you know what I want? I want sonship. I want him to remember, you're my dad. And you love me. To me, you're always good. I trust you. There are limits. I don't need to go there. Period. Simple. All right? You guys are all part of the one. Did he go back there? They were good kids. They didn't go back there. No blind kids. See, they all have their sight. <laughs> okay? But that's the question. Jesus is a man. All these people are pressing up against him. He has the, every opportunity now. I've got to go out and be a king and change the world. How do you go do that? Well, all the power, I've got all the power. All the people are going to show up. I can use the power. And then they'll all follow me. And then I'll just go, I'll use power and change the world. Right? No. No. Why? Because he may be a Messiah and he has to be a king and he has to go change the world. But that's not actually, 
his deepest personal identity. That's not where his deepest place is. You know where his deepest place is? To be a son. That's his deepest place. To whom? To God. The son of God. That's what it says in the Bible. And then, if his place is to be a son of God, what does he have to do? He has to obey and trust. Now, let's, let's, why is it this way? People show up, they have diseases. He's like, you're healed. Awesome. Okay? Let me tell you something. Are all their problems gone? But their blindness, they have leprosy, they have cancer. Jesus goes, cancer. Now their problems are solved, right? They're just going to live a perfect life. They're going to be wonderful. All their problems are solved. Is that true? Is that true? Of course not. What, what's left over? Okay, they had a big problem solved. Leprosy, cancer, something. Huge problem. It just got solved. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now what's left? They're still themselves. <laughs> what's left is they're still a sinful, wicked person just like Adam. There's a God who says, I'm always for you. Everything I have is to be close to you and give everything of myself to you. Will you trust me? Do they have that? Do they have that? They don't have that. <laughs> you solve the cancer, but do they have the God that they go have coffee with? <laughs> Do they have that? Do they have a calm heart that obeys and trusts like a son, like a close daughter? Do they have that? Do they have humility that they don't grab after power? <laughs> Instead, they'll choose obedience. <laughs> Not power, humility, obedience. Do they have that? Do you have that? I don't have that. Jesus could fix your cancer. And sometimes he was compassionate. There's places in the Bible, lots of broken people show up. And then he heals only one person. That's weird. That's kind of mean, doesn't it? That seems kind of mean. One person. And all these other broken, sick people. Doesn't heal them, but heals this person. Just like, cherry picks this one person. You're blood. Get up. And then he ignores everybody. Else. Weird. <laughs> it's really weird. Because maybe he didn't come to heal cancer. <laughs> maybe he came to heal a, a deeper disease. You get what I'm saying? Let's go to part two. What do you want from God? What do you want from God? Some of you are, I need a better job. <laughs> I need a better job. Or, or like, we have credit card debt. Need to make some more money. Need a better job. Some of you are like, that's like, that's like you pray that every night. <laughs> better job, better job. God, you're like powerful. <laughs> better job, please. Right? Some of you, it's a little harder. Um, or, okay, well, actually, let me, let me, let me connect to some of you. Higher SAT score. <laughs> Good SAT score. Please don't put that reading section on there that I, that I stink at. No poetry. <laughs> no poetry analysis. <laughs> and then I will, instead of, you know, uh, I'll have 40 points higher. Please, Jesus, no poetry analysis. Right? Please get me into this college. And then maybe it's a little more painful. Um, my, um, my, my, my sister has cancer. My sister has cancer. God, if my sister dies, I can't handle it. I can't handle it. Please, please. So just, that's what you want from God. Every day. You wake up. I'm a church planner as a pastor. You know what I, you know what I pray for every day? 
we need a new building. <laughs> we need a new place. And then I'm like, okay, then now we need money to pay for this place. <laughs> oh, we need new, new members. We need new members. We need a better band. The Lord's already answered that one. <laughs> That's a good one. I was like, oh, I was like, oh, thank you. While we were this morning, I was like, thank you, Jesus. After you get the better band, you know what happens? I'm still me. You know what we all want? This is the real problem in life. We don't live in the garden. And because we do not live in the Garden of Eden, where God, you have coffee with God. You walk around naked, just like, naked, no problem. <laughs> Everybody knows me. I know them. Nobody's wicked. My best friend is God. I have everything. I have everything. And then some. I have God. <laughs> if uh, the food over there isn't very good, I'm like, God, can we get better food? He's like, sure. Boom. <laughs> New fruit. That's your God. I'm feeling lonely. He shows up with you. Actually, you never feel lonely because he's always with you. How do you like that? Just think for a moment. You never feel lonely because you have a wife and you have God. Maybe you can even train the dog, but you don't really need the dog because you got a wife and you got God. So you never, just, just, just think for a moment. You never feel lonely. Never. Zero. Zip. Never. Never happens. Then just think about that for a moment. Okay? If you had that, would you ever need money? Would you ever need money? Would you ever need status? Would you ever need a better SAT score? Would you ever need to be good looking? Would you ever need to be taller than somebody else? You get what I'm saying? In this world, if God is not there, there, and you know he's there, there, then you've got to have something else. You've got to have something that gives you some piece of power. Because we're like naked beings and like, oh gosh, I'm alone and like I'm naked and nobody can see me. I'm naked because like, like gosh, like those people are better looking and they're taller and they're like, they got something. <laughs> so now we live in this world without God and no, everybody covers up and everybody's fake and phony and we got to have something. So whatever that thing is, that's the thing we got to get and that's the thing we ask God for. Power. It's usually, like, I'll just use that word, power. Better grade. What's a better grade for? Better grade says you're smart. Then because you're smart, you go to the smart college, and then you get more money. Money is power. <laughs> more money means you can get people to do what you want. You can get a better house, and people respect you. It's power. So human beings are constantly thinking about the things that gives us, give me more power, give me something in this world, because we don't have God. Just, he's just there with us, for us, always, all the time. So... We got to get something. Better grades. I want to be better looking. You know, that, it's true. If you're better looking, people are better to you. It's just totally true. I got to drop some weight and get skinny and be like really hot looking. It's, it's true. If you get that, your life will be better. But you'll still be you. <laughs> you'll still be you. So when Jesus looks at us, when Jesus looks at us, you know what he sees? I can fix your cancer. I can give you a better job. But you know what I really want to give you? Me. You get what I'm saying? What I really want to give you, the real disease, your real disease, is lack of me. You're not in the garden. You're alone. And you're naked. And everybody else is a dangerous animal. That's like the way the, mark, the gospel mark starts. You're not in the Garden of Eden. You're in a wilderness. And in the wilderness, there's dangerous animals and the devil. And the most dangerous animal are people. And you're alone. You know what we ask for from God? More power. Something. Something, please. You look for the biggest problem in your life, what you think is the biggest problem in your life, and you ask God to fix it. That's what's happening here. 
But you know what he wants to give you? He says, what I actually want to give you is, I'm going to be the son of God so you could be a son of God. You could be a son, always with the Father. And you trust him, like the way Jesus does. You're close to him, like the way Jesus does. That's really what human beings are supposed to be. We're made in the image of God. And the Son of God came to restore the image of God. He made to make us sons like Him. See, the Father didn't show up. He goes, you know what? What they really need is to be human. And to be human is to be like the Son. <laughs> it's kind of strange. <laughs> to be human is made in the image of God. You know there's a place in the Bible that says, you know who is the image of God? Who is the very image of God? Jesus. So Jesus the Son came to heal the brokenness of what it means. Because we are human beings, not in the image of God. You know what we really are every day? This is really sad to say. We're made in the image of beasts. <laughs> like animals biting each other. And you know where we got that from? The devil. And the biggest disease he came to heal was that. <laughs> and he had to choose obedience of his father. Not power. Not power. So now let's get to the close of the message. So the father said, you're going to go down there. The, their biggest problem is that they're humans, but they would rather be following the devil. And even when they pray to me, all they want is stuff. <laughs> when they pray, they don't ask to know us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and have us deeply loved them. What they want is our stuff. <laughs> Most of us, you want something from God. But do you want God? It's a different question. We all want something from God. But do you want just God? To Him to be with you. To give you His heart. To give you the Son's heart. To give you the Son's trust. If the Son is with you, and the son's heart goes into you, you will look at God as he looks at God. And you know how the son looks at God? He's always with him. The son is always with the father. He would never disobey the fruit or anything. See, what's happening here is there's a fruit being offered to Jesus, except it has nothing to do with fruit. It's grab the power. That's the temptation. Grab the power. <coughs> His other thing is, trust my father. <laughs> Obey my father. Be a son. They need me to be the son. So they can be sons and daughters. And be with the father. And be loved by my father. Just as I'm loved by my father. You know what that would take? A great trust and obedience. And you know what it would take? A much greater miracle than cancer. He'll have to trust and obey his father all the way up to the cross. And all of the world and all of these human beings who act more like devils will then crucify him. But then he will obey and trust his father all the way. All our wicked evil where we're trying to use God will be upon him. But then, if we give our lives to Jesus, you know what can happen? Now we have the possibility, through his death and resurrection, that his sonship, love, and trust of the Father and closeness to the Father can be ours through the cross. I think that's what's happening in this passage. She's saying, not the power. <laughs> What these people need is sonship. They need to learn how to be really human. They need to walk in life and know, Father, 
that they have you. And the cost will be the cross. Let me obey you. So they can have not stuff from us. They can have all of God. They can have God. We can go back to the garden. Better than the garden. Love God. Let's pray.